I'm Scott L. Miller. This is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua, with the recent events that happened in New York City over the last couple of days with the assassination of the CEO of the largest insurance provider in the United States, or private insurance provider, health insurance provider in the United States. It brings to light a lot of the feelings and problems that Americans have with their health care system, between being forced into using certain providers, into not getting adequate health care, into uh, incredible costs and weights and denials and destroying of lives and deaths caused by things outside of the actual medical care system. This highlights a number of things that we really should discuss when we're talking about how Nicaragua and other countries interface with your own personal health and things that you probably, if you really stopped and thought about it, would be aware of. But because it's not something that we're really acutely thinking about, you may not realize just how important these things are. So let's talk about how the ancillary components of your health care will change your life right after the bump. If you're coming from most of the English-speaking world, some things about healthcare are taken very much for granted. Primarily that you can't afford it and what you get will be really bad, and there's a lot of surprises waiting for you after the fact that could very well destroy your life, and your loved ones may not be able to get the care that they need, even if they've paid for it, for decades ahead of time because they're just lost in the bureaucracy of the system, private or public. These things really impact people in the US, Canada, UK, and so forth, the US more than others, but all of them have significant problems that leave people constantly struggling to get the care that they need. Regular conversations I have with people who are currently in US and Canada about uh, the reasons that they're looking at or have moved abroad in the past or looking at moving abroad now often are based around a complete inability to get the care that they need. And speaking to people this week who are simply being shot down for critical life uh, providing care uh, in the U.S. highlights this, even though completely coincidental with the fact that uh, the CEO of United Health was killed this week. But in his death came so many comments so in, on, in, in the Reddit threads and in uh, uh, memes and such where people are expressing, you know, a lot of ideas uh, as the CEO of United Health. Could he be considered a serial killer? He was responsible for the deaths of its believed thousands or tens of thousands of Americans by simply using bureaucracy to steal their money and kill them for it. And often serial killers aren't stealing from you, so that may not qualify for that, but we all understand basically this is a person who's able to target uh, his, his victims very effectively because he had access to private information that normal ind uh, uh, individuals do not have access to. He was in a privileged position and, and specifically able to extort them and kill them for their income uh, very easily. And, uh, Thousands of people impacted by this, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands more impacted by simply not getting critical care that they need or being put through a lot of distress or other problems, things that to most of the world would be unthinkable, but to Americans is often taken as a matter of course. And it seems strange to think that there's actually healthcare without these problems in the rest of the world. But to most of the world, that's not how healthcare works. But not often when I'm speaking to Americans or Canadians about moving to Nicaragua or other countries that are similar, things that they're worried about are uh, wait times for healthcare or simply the availability of specialty services. And so we're often focused on those things. Can I get really high quality care? Yes, better than you're used to. Oh, but is it affordable? Yes, better than you're used to. Oh, the, the wait times must be terrible. Nope, they're better than you're used to. Oh, but I don't have insurance. How's that going to work? Well, generally, you can pay out of pocket cheaper than insurance would cost you somewhere else for a certain... I've never heard of anybody who's had to pay more than, say, 10% in Nicaragua what they would have paid over the same period of time in insurance, let alone medical costs, let alone worry and other things. So those are the things we tend to focus on, and they're super important, of course. But there's a lot of other things, and that's where this, these Reddit threads and, and, and memes and such about United Health have really hit home. And in discussions with other people, it is how often in the United States and Canada, both of those, I've talked to people recently, uh, where people had uh, or, or are in in life-threatening situations and they're simply being denied 
care in Canada being denied because they fall outside of a predefined policy. And so the policy doesn't address their medical needs. And so they're put into a loop where they just can't get out of it. They can't get to a point where care is provided. And in the United States, where doctors are not required to provide any specific level of care, any given doctor is allowed to turn you down. And in the case that they're in, every doctor is turning them down. In some cases, it's simply because they're too young to receive this care and they're they're at a point where their life cannot continue but the the medical system is unwilling to provide them the care that they need and unable to provide them any kind of alternative, and it's illegal for them to take matters into their own hands. So they're caught in a situation, in both these cases, two different countries, two very different scenarios, where the healthcare system is simply failing and they have no recourse except for to leave the country. Of course, that is the one thing. And we just talked about this, right? That, you know, the power of American expats. I have a couple of videos, the power of the expat and, and the the American expat and talking about that this is, you know, part of being an American is having this access to the right to the world, not not that the world owes us anything, but America empowers us to be allowed to travel around the world, to have the financial power to travel around the world. The U.S. works really hard to give us that power, even if it doesn't work to give us health care. It does provide us access to the world's health care in a way that very few places do. I mean, it's not unique, but it is pretty good. And so we can look at being Americans in a different light and say that by being an American, I do have access to Nicaragua's healthcare. I have access to Mexico's healthcare. I have access to Switzerland and France and Colombia, some of the world's absolute finest healthcare, things that as an American, I can't get at home, but I can get abroad. And we often talk about that in Nicaragua, that leveraging your region is just part of being a normal uh, world citizen. It's something that Americans often are, are taught in our local level, right? Our, our teachers, our friends, our social circles have a tendency to, to kind of enforce this prison mentality of America. But at the federal level, America doesn't do that. America fights really hard to open the world to us. So it's strange that at such a grassroots level, there tends to be this uh, harming our neighbors, this uh, mental abuse, Stockholm syndrome in a way to try to convince people that they can't go act like global citizens and leverage all these rights and privileges that America has worked so hard to, to acquire for us. But you need to in order to be healthy as an American in many cases or to be affordably healthy, if nothing else. So let's look at some of these things that came up in these discussions about United Health. One is denials. And we just mentioned that. But denials are a really big deal. When you're going for health care in the U.S. and Canada, Specifically, uh, it is really common, and we hear from people all the time, and I've nearly died from this myself, where I went in with, an, in my case, it was appendicitis, but people can go in for any number of things, and they simply get denied. Either the hospital and the doctors have the right to not take care of you, that they're not under any mandate to provide your health care. Maybe the system can't turn you down at a system uh, systematic level, but the individual doctors can simply deny you service because they don't feel like taking on the insurance responsibility or whatever. In most countries, if they they turn you down and something bad happens, like you die, they're on the hook for having turned you down. But in the United States, they're on the hook for treating you. So they're encouraged to simply not provide life-affirming care. That's a really big deal, right? So so in, in some cases, it's much more minor, but you live with ailments or the inability to heal or, or um, an inability to work or whatever, because the medical system won't provide a, an amputation, for example. They say, well, no, you're not, they're not willing to do that. Or now a lot of women are facing uh, that they're looking for uh, uh, surgeries that will um, prevent future, especially women who are in a position where it is medically dangerous for them uh, to, to become pregnant. Uh, and now there's a lot of care missing within uh, the female space, um, so they're looking for preventative care, and that is has long been denied in the United States. So one of the problems that we're facing there is that new laws are being put in place that only have the, the slightest ability uh, of being in any way sensible if there's this other care that also doesn't exist in the United States. So it's a cumulative thing that as a woman, it can be extremely dangerous if you are simply in a life-threatening position and could be prevented from getting pregnant, that the system will is actually designed and every, ask any woman who has tried to do this, the story is consistent. As long as you're of childbearing ages, you'll be refused this care point blank 100% of the time. And, and the only means of, of getting that 
care for a life-threatening condition is to travel abroad and leave the United States. That's a dramatic case, but for me, just my appendix. My appendix burst because the doctor didn't feel like dealing with it, just didn't want to talk about it, sent me home, pumped me full of drugs to make me not notice the appendix so he could get me out of the hospital. Those kinds of things are routine in America. Everybody who's done any amount of stuff with the American Medical has these stories. I'm not unique, I'm not special, I'm just average in this case. So that kind of stuff, the idea that you can just be denied by the hospital and more commonly by your insurance. Well, I need this surgery. They're going to make me spend a year trying other things first. It's going to cost a fortune and makes no sense. There's hoping I die along the way or whatever. And we're not even talking about the VA system, which some people, I have personal friends who have died in the VA system because they were left to die point blank murdered by the VA system. But I know a lot of you have had good experience. It's very hit or miss, and I understand it's improved over time. But we're not talking about the VA here. We're talking about the regular medical system. Regular Americans are constant. Not that, not that vets aren't regular Americans, but you know what I mean. People in the public space, in the just generic system, are being left in many cases to suffer or die, to be unable to work, uh, to be unable to work to capacity, uh, and just living much diminished lives because the insurance company doesn't want to pay out on their obligations. And remember, you are in a situation where you are, by all m measures, forced to pay into this insurance. It's not actually insurance. It's actually a tax. It is hidden to make it, Americans feel like they're privatized health care. If there isn't privatized health care in the United States, that insurance is required. That makes it a tax. Black and white, there's no gray area. It is 100% a tax. You are taxed, but there's no government oversight of that taxed money. That taxed money is being handed to private corporations who act as an unregulated government agency and then have absolutely no benefits to be gained by providing the services that they are mandated to provide. And so it is in their financial benefit to skirt their responsibilities, to shirk their responsibilities, and to hope that you either just give up or pass away. They financially benefit from that happening. And so they work to some degree to do that, not 100% of the time, but there's always a financial incentive to do that. And the, the benefits of having a healthy and happy uh, working economy don't apply to them. The people who benefit from that are the very people being harmed by this. The system is designed for failure across the board. All of the mechanisms that should be working together towards a common goal are undermined and short-circuited. So it is extremely common absolutely expect it that you are going to be denied for care that you need in many cases and at best you'll have to spend lots of time fighting for it and in quite a few cases never get it often you'll be able to get it but at great expense uh, and the thing that you've paid for the insurance won't be there for you any moment that you have to spend uh, fighting for your insurance that's you paying again because that's your time and your money and your effort and your risk and your your health care on the line and being eroded. Because if you're sick and you can't get care, you're going to keep getting worse. Now, in some cases, the delay is not a big deal. In some, it causes death, and most things are somewhere in between. This is a really major issue that people don't often really think about because they assume it's just part of the game, but it is absolutely not. In places like Nicaragua, if you need care, you get it immediately. If you need care and the doctors don't believe you should get it, you have ability to get it. Now, if you want free care and it's something that the doctors don't agree with you on, you're generally not going to get free care from the public system on a voluntary basis. But if you're in that situation, you go to the private hospitals and say, look, I, I, my leg is not working. It is a serious problem. Nobody can fix it. Therefore, I need it amputated. Well, they're allowed to do that. And they have a lot of experience in that specific thing because of the wars. But if you need that done and the public system says, no, this is the right thing for you. We don't agree. We'll treat, we'll, we'll do whatever we can. We're going to keep you alive. We're not going to let it deteriorate, but we're not going to do, we don't think that's the right course of action. You still have options to go get that done. Yes, it'll cost you some money, but never will it cost you a fraction of what it would cost to just have insurance that gets denied in the United States. Think about that. In the U.S., it's common to spend $10,000 for insurance that doesn't even pay out when you need it to. And because if you try to use it, they will raise the cost of the services so you're dependent on the, the insurance. 
right? A procedure that should cost $1,000, $500, might be listed at $10,000, but the insurance company gets a break. They only spend $2,000. So as long as your insurance pays, they only pay $2,000. But if they deny you and you still need it, you pay $10,000. It's a very tricky system. Now, of course, there are some doctors who then give you a discount to, to offset that because they feel terrible about that system, and that's great. But that's a unreliable mechanism. It's terrible that that is even allowed to exist. It should be that everything's at a set price. That makes sense, and no one can, can manipulate manipulate prices of healthcare for emergency services when you're in an emergency state. You've already negotiated for your, your insurance. Your negotiation should be over, but instead they wait until you're in a position where you can't negotiate and they're extorting you for your life and they start a new negotiation that you never agreed to in the first place, but there's nothing you can do about it. They're holding your life on the line. When it comes to healthcare, the only thing that ultimately protects you is the police. If the police cannot intervene on your behalf and say, whoa, this person's at risk and you have to provide legally mandated healthcare, you are completely exposed. There's no limit to the amount of extortion that can happen through the healthcare system. It could be doctors, it could be insurance providers, it doesn't matter. Whoever it is, anyone who's involved in, in healthcare provisioning can simply hold you hostage. And I know trying to get healthcare myself during COVID, I needed to get a CPAP. There was companies along the way who had no doctors involved. They were not part of the insurance. My insurance wanted me to get health care. My doctor wanted me to have health care. Everything was written. They had prescriptions, everything. And the actual company that provided the, the materials, they got the license for the region that I lived in, said, nope, you have to do all these things, pay us tons of money, do all these really dangerous things because they didn't want to provide the services. And they basically made it that I'd be breaking the law and putting myself at major health risk in order to follow their procedures and making it that I had to choose between one type of health care problem and another, and simply they had purchased not being medical professionals, not being insurance providers. They had absolutely no medical component to them, but they owned the distribution rights for the things that we needed, and they had the right to extort us for anything that they wanted. There's no oversight whatsoever. These are all just cumulative problems that we all feel when we work with the healthcare system, but we rarely put our finger down and we rarely go abroad and examine other systems and say, how does it work somewhere else? How, would this problem exist somewhere else? How would it be handled? And realize that the things that we expect, those long delays, those worries about denials, those uh, uh, hospital refusing to do the thing that we need, not listening to the patient, the, the lack of of advocation uh, that you need. All of those things, when you come to most other countries, you're simply gonna get those things. Instantly, they're gonna go away. And, and that fear, that stress, those delays, that potential financial ruin, all of those things that will make healthcare uh, less valuable. Even if you can finally, after months of fighting in the US or Canada, finally get that care you need, maybe you're gonna get an amputation that you need. They could have done it on day one and done it for a tiny amount of money, right? All of that fighting over insurance, not only does it cost you money, it costs them money too. The entire system becomes outrageously expensive just to the American economy or the Canadian economy in general because there's so much effort going into avoiding providing health care. For a fraction of the cost here in Nicaragua, they'll just provide your health care. And instead of ruining your life, they'll let you move on. They will get you to a position where you're as healthy as you can be as quickly as possible so that you can rejoin the workforce. It's in the interest of the nation. In fact, the entire American and Canadian healthcare mechanisms are enemies of the state, except that they're paying people off. But from a public perspective, they are outright, basically terrorist organizations. They're, they're organized crime using your healthcare as a bargaining chip to attack the American economy and the American people. There are few people that are more openly hostile to you as an American. To work, to be involved in that insurance mechanism is an outright open hatred of every American citizen, a true loathing. It is disgusting, it is beyond imagination, and yet it is every day. And there's a reason why so many people are joyous at the assassination of the CEO of United Health. While we all want to say it's sad that a human had to lose his life, when we think of him in the context of a serial killer, when you compare him to just being an impotent Hitler, of course he wanted to be Hitler, his power was just much more limited. But the damage that he did is extensive. The number of lives he took, the number of lives he destroyed, when you think of it in that context, it's unfortunate that a person died, but it's not unfortunate that it was him, and it actually probably will end up saving a lot of lives because places like United Health are going to think a little bit more about destroying a life because sometimes there are consequences to being abject evil and, and putting a price tag on people's lives. 
It just is what it is. But it really is this dramatic. We really have to think about how horribly, abhorrently evil these mechanisms are, and we accept them because we're told over and over again by the people in these mechanisms that this is the best way to do it, that this is the only way it'll ever work, while the whole world demonstrates that that is unbelievably false and should be logically false. There's nothing about the American uh, insurance-based mechanisms that has any basis in logic or reality whatsoever. There's no way to look at it and say, oh yeah, no, it must work this way. Everything is as illogical as it could possibly be. No person who cared about healthcare at any point was involved in the decision about this. Every single component of it is how much can we make it cost and how little can we care about ultimately providing health care. Those factors are just so dramatic. Those delays, those denials, those financial ruins, sometimes it causes you to avoid getting health care you need because you're scared or you're not willing to put in the effort. Well, I have this little infection on my foot, but I'm sure it'll be fine, and chances are it will be. It's not a major thing. Could go septic, but probably not, right? Now, if you were in Nicaragua, one, you could just go get your own antibiotic. Not that I'm recommending that, but you would have that right. If you knew what to do, what if you were a doctor? I have friends who are non-practicing doctors. They're full doctors. They can even talk to other doctors that are also not, they, they, you know, friends with doctors, and they can just say, hey, is this the right antibiotic? Is this, should I? Yeah, no, all my training says I should. They can just walk into a pharmacy and get the medicine that they need. Done. They can tell their friends, oh no, you that you should get amoxicillin. Just go to the store, $3 and you're done. Excellent. I don't need to worry about being denied. I don't have to worry about some hospital getting my information and charging me tens of thousands of dollars for having walked in the door. Real things that happen. Um, all kinds of things, right? You just And it's fast. This isn't like some huge ordeal where oh, I've got to take off of work. I've got to get an appointment. I've got to wait. Sure, it might all be done in a day or two, but it's a major ordeal. For us, the same thing is just pulling over by the side of the road on the way home from lunch. And three minutes later for $3, we have everything we need and we're good to go. Now, it's a super minor incident, but it shows how dramatically different we approach healthcare. When I needed an x-ray, 20 bucks and 15 minutes later. If I need to go see a doctor and ask some questions, I'm normally able to see one within 20 minutes. Uh, and, and for minimal cost, a cost so low that it'd be roughly the uh, a well-visit copay in most of the United States, which is often $10 to $15, right? At least back when I was in the US, it was $10. It's probably gone up now, but I'm just assuming about that price. So these are real amounts that I'm able to do that anytime. I know I can get answers. Oh, my foot's a little bit sore. Why keep walking on it? I can swing into my doctor and get real care for $20. That's what my, my foot doctor costs. And, and, and have an expert tell me, should I ice it, heat it, uh, take some medicine, walk on it, don't walk on it, ignore it, don't ignore it, whatever. Right? All these things are so important. It makes getting basic care a very casual thing. But Americans and Canadians are often, I, I can't afford the time to go do that. I can't afford the risk of that they might cause me problems. My wife one time visited a doctor's office, paid everything on the spot, gave him a credit card, got in writing that everything had been paid, and five years later they were still extorting us for more money. Eventually we got lawyers involved, we wrote reviews, we did a whole bunch of stuff, and eventually they backed off and admitted they had falsified all the records. I have friends who once delivered someone else to a hospital and the hospital was able to ascertain his identity through uh, some third party means illegally pulled his data and tried to slam him with medical charges from a facility he had never been admitted to. They literally just looked up his social security number and used it to try to extort him for money in Texas, right? Both of these were in Texas, one in Houston, one in Dallas. But these are, these are problems that Americans face every day. Nearly every American at some point is being charged for healthcare they've never received simply because some healthcare provider managed to acquire their identity information. You don't have that fear in Nicaragua. That's reasonably never going to happen. And if it did, it's a flat out crime. It's identity theft. It's theft. It's threatening. It's extortion. Those are things that the police show up about. In the United States, uh, it's a discussion with your credit rating company, right? The, the degree to which they're allowed to just run roughshod over your freedoms and your rights is extreme. Those things go away. That feeling of safety is a whole different lifestyle down here. So that's, those are big things. I, I can't overstate how much better you your health improves when you're able to see a doctor at the drop of a hat to get honest feedback and everything is affordable so that you're not in a position, I don't know anyone who's ever been in a position here where they're wondering if it was worth paying for the care that was recommended. You know, it's 
always a discussion of, should I go with the public? Do I want to pay for the local private? Do I want to pay for the luxury private Managua? Do I want to bother driving to Managua? Do I want to just go, you know, do I want to take an ambulance? Do I want to drive myself? Those kinds of things. Yes, those discussions all the time. But whether I should get the procedure they told me to, whether I should take the medicine they told me to, no, that never comes up because it's so affordable and it's so easy. Everything is designed for you to get the healthcare you need as quickly and simply and cheaply as possible because having healthy people right away benefits everyone and it's just the right thing to do. And in America, all those things are the opposite. Everything's a roadblock. Everything's a, and, and in Canada too, we're going to delay it. We're going to make it expensive. We're going to make you scared. We're going to make you question. We're going to make you, you know, have to jump through so many hoops that probably you'll give up or fail at some point. And it also makes it that if you're rich and have can afford an advocate and are really educated in how the healthcare system works, your chances of getting healthcare are quite high. And if you can afford to have a private physician, you're basically guaranteed to be able to get what you need. But if you are poor and don't have amazing healthcare, if you can't afford an advocate, if you're not super versed on the system, if you can't afford a lawyer to fight for your financial freedom, uh, then simply visiting a doctor can be a life-destroying uh, thing. So you go in with an infected foot and suddenly they accidentally, right? charge you for a heart transplant and it goes on your record um, and they extort you for hundreds of thousands of dollars that you can't declare bankruptcy and get away from. None of it that you did. Simply, they have the power to steal from you in such a way that there's nothing you can reasonably do about it unless you have deep financial resources to be able to fight them. And doctors and healthcare systems tend to have extremely deep pockets because of the way the system works. So their ability to protect against you is really extreme and your ability to protect against them does not exist. Your protection. You have one protection in this case, and that is using your passport, using those rights and privileges of Americans to become expats, get on a plane or a car, a bus, and in some cases there might even be a train, and leave. Go across that southern border. The moment you're in Mexico, you are protected from a healthcare perspective. The farther you go, there's more and more options throughout the region. There are so many places you could go. Europe, Southeast Asia, great healthcare is available very affordably all over the world. The problems that you get in North America and the UK are relatively unique. You don't have to worry if those things are going to follow you. Reasonably, they can't. There's really nowhere in the world that is as bad. And that shocks Americans. There's so much marketing that goes into convincing you that you have adequate healthcare that it sometimes becomes plausible to feel like maybe you could believe that no matter how illogical, no matter how obvious, no matter how much you're told it isn't true. It's like, but, but how could poorer countries be better by not taking advantage of you? That's why, right? It is what it is. It's unfortunate that North America is in such a position, but it is, but you have the power. Nobody really feels badly in the system because they all know that you can fix it if you so choose. You have the power, the right to get on a plane, move to another country, and fix those things for yourself. It's unfortunate that that is the answer that they leave you with. But at least they leave you with an answer and understanding that when we talk about how much better healthcare is in other countries, and especially here in Nicaragua, because that's where I am, so people ask me about it all the time, when we're talking about that, we're so often focused on these more primary issues, that it's easy to forget just how significant these other things, the actual insurance mechanisms, the actual denial problems, the, the actual delays or refusals for the type of care that we actually need, that we, we kind of gloss over those. But those, in many cases, are unbelievably significant. And if you're in like the VA system, while I understand it has improved a lot and some people have had great care there now, they have so much more bureaucracy to deal with some of these things. While the other things may be better, these things can be worse there in some circumstances. In other, better, right? It's, it's a different system. But the same things exist in both cases. And it's, it's, it's an eye-opening experience. And it's a whole area where I would move for this reason alone. And it's in an area that we just don't talk about. So I, I'm... I'm hoping that this gives you a bit of a, a bigger picture and a way to think about healthcare here and healthcare in the United States and reasons uh, and motivation to really look more broadly at, oh, this is what America has empowered me to do. This is what Canada is giving me the right to do. This is how I solve those problems. And it is open to me. It's available right now. And even if you aren't becoming an expat, going abroad for your health care is, in most cases, not emergencies, but in most cases, uh, open to you and, and something that 
people that in my walk of life did all along. It was common to go to Mexico and Colombia and other places for healthcare whenever it was possible because they knew it was more affordable and far superior care. Well, those are things you could also do or you could do to try out the system and then say, oh, you know, non-emergency care was so great. I would love to not have emergencies, but if I would love to know that if I did have an emergency, this is the option that's available to me because I'm living in that area and can just have the ambulance pick me up, take me to the local hospital and never have to worry about the kinds of things that I'm used to having to worry about. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, we got that buy me a coffee link above. You can hit that or you can join our membership just $5 a month. It doesn't get you anything. It's just that great feeling you get of helping make sure that this channel doesn't go away. Now, we've been here for years. We're going to make it, but really appreciate everyone who makes it financially possible. It is very expensive to create all this content. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you all tomorrow.